love talking about herbal medicine. It's my most favorite thing to do. I'm primarily a practitioner and a educator, so I'm not a research scientist, but I do practice what I like to call like evidence-based or evidence-informed herbal medicine. So taking, um, we'll be looking at herbs today, but looking at them from a few different angles. And you know, my goal was, I think with detoxification, most of you probably are even aware that you can get like herbal detoxes in a box from lots of drugstores and retailers are selling these, these types of combination products and a lot of people are using them and a lot of celebrities have their own detoxes that they market as well. They're very popular right now and I think having a solid understanding of the herbs that are in those products that patients are already taking and also my hope is that clinicians if you're already using herbs in your practice that you are better able to individualize those types of detoxification protocols for your treatment, that the kind of one-size-fits-all approach maybe isn't the best way uh, to go about things. So who here is already using herbs in their, in their practice? Fantastic. Is anyone doing, I know it's different kind of everywhere, but is anyone doing compounding, like blending of liquid herbs a little bit? Great, okay, fantastic. So that's, that's pretty much the, the foundation of my herbal practice. So why herbs? I kind of just start sometimes with my own little, uh, just a bit of my background. I'm, as I said, a naturopathic doctor, registered herbalist. When I was in naturopathic school, felt very strongly that, um, that plants would be my focus, either through nutrition or through kind of a Western herbal approach, which is how we were taught in school. Uh, I viewed them, or we were taught about them in terms of very mechanistic uh, you know, their mechanism of actions, their pharmacology, their safety, don't kill anyone was the primary concern really uh, to get through school. So that was how we were taught them. At the same time, uh, you know, we, we really understood that they were more than just bags of chemicals. Um, sorry, uh, that they were, they were, of course, plants contain macro, micronutrients that will benefit our health in a variety of ways. But the medicinal herbs are packed with those phytonutrients. So they are concentrated medicinal foods. So all of, you know, we talk about the benefits this morning of, you know, eating your fruits and veg and plant-based diet in terms of disease prevention, diabetes prevention. Um, we, we, when we're using plants, we're tapping into that, but we're getting so much more uh, when, we, when we take these really concentrated doses. And so in herbal medicine, obviously, we refer to these as the plant constituents. And these are things like flavonoids and tannins. Um, saponins, alkaloids, things like that. So beyond though that bag of chemicals, I want to, I don't know if anyone's heard of the biophilia hypothesis before, but this is something that I try to incorporate in my pro practice and was taught to me. Um, so the biophilia hypothesis was put forward by a biologist, Edward Wilson, in the 18, uh, 1980s. And he basically explored research around the innate emotional affiliation that humans have with the plant world and proposed that there was this, uh, this co-evolutionary um, relationship that was um, emotional in nature that, uh, that humans had. And I think we have lots of evidence now pointing towards the benefits of time in nature. And as a naturopathic doctor, I'm a bit biased here, but I prescribe nature time to my patients. And I'm really uh, interested in, in, in seeing when I use plants with people in office how I can also further that relationship outside of the office. And I, I think this is uh, something that we can leverage and, and really see, I think, greater effects. So in my office, when I give somebody a herb, it, you know, sometimes it's just a weird liquid in a brown bottle that tastes and smells funny or you know, a bottle of capsules. But when you actually see the plant, right, this is a picture of um, a student of mine on a herb walk at the medicinal botanical garden. Um, near the college where I teach and we, you know, we learn about the plant and understand that they are, when you sit with a plant for a little while, you understand that it's more than a bag of chemicals. You can actually develop relationships with, with plants and I, I think uh, this is something that is important. I have a picture here. Does anybody know what plant is in that bottom little box there? Does that look familiar to anybody? It's a very common weed that like, grows probably 10 feet outside the doorsteps here in, in the hotel. I'll give you a hint, psyllium seed come, is related to this plant. Plantain, yes, this is Plantago major. So 
this is a plant I just like to point out and I like to tell my patients about because, you know, they recognize that here is a, a, a medicine that we're just walking all over all of the time and we douse with pesticides also to try to get rid of it, which is so silly because it's, it's a medicinal food that we can actually take to benefit our health in a variety of ways and we see this with dandelion and burdock and these other plants as well. So, just taking a bit of a broader picture, we are going to talk about the pharmacology of some of these plants, but I, I think it's uh, important to start from this place and this recognition of just how holistic a medicine that they, they really are. And looking back at every traditional model, philosophical medical model, over the past millennia, we see traditional Chinese medicine. Do we have acupuncturists in the room? Great, or doctors of Chinese medicine, great. Uh, you know, back to Ayurveda, to the Greek-Roman humoral medical theory, to you know, indigenous and animistic traditions of medicine. The common thread, and there's many common threads throughout these these traditions, and these were all, you know, developed to treat, prevent, and diagnose disease. Uh, they all included herbs. So herbs have been used for thousands of years in all of these traditions, and all of them primarily with the goal of re-establishing balance. It was the doctor's duty to re-establish balance, whether that was through um, the, the elemental type theory or through balancing the doshas or the humors. Um, this, was, this was a huge part of treatment. And from a detoxification standpoint, there was a common thread as well that disease was viewed as, a, as the body not being able to properly eliminate pathogens or toxins in some way, or in even animistic traditions, spirits would be invading the body that would need to be removed, and it was the shaman's job to use plants and other sorts of modalities to remove it. In TCM, improper elimination, chronic disease was viewed as uh, the body's ability, the elimination organs not being able to properly do their job, and so the disease goes deeper into the body. And then we look at humoral medicine, which really took this to extremes and did all kinds of crazy heroic-like treatments. Uh, this is where we get like bloodletting, things like that. Um, but this idea, again, that the disease needed to be purged and removed from the body. And so it just this is common. So herbal medicine historically and detoxification historically, elimination was viewed as one of the, the primary methods of treatment. So it was kind of the first thing the physician tried to do was eliminate some sort of toxin or pathogen from the body. And this was because they, you know, it, evidentially they, they saw a person experiencing certain symptoms like vomiting or uh, diaphoresis or uh, cough, and these were all viewed as the body's trying to expel something. So treatments were often aimed at encouraging that. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, these really extreme methods, which we definitely don't want to do today. So definitely, we don't, we don't want to, yeah, we don't want to practice heroic medicine in any form. We really, and I think we need to be careful with thinking about health as just purging ourselves all of the time, which is something I see with these detox in a boxes and detoxes that everyone just sees their bodies as these like toxic things that we need to just purify. And that, you know, might be a part of, of what you need to do with your patient, but also nourishing and tonifying the body is really important as well. And if we're not repairing, the body is the same time as we're eliminating waste, then we're, we're really not helping that person at all. So understanding how to take these types of uh, long-term and short-term approaches to detoxification is important. But definitely in my practice, um, ma many cases start with a gentle detox, a gentle herbal detox. And, and of course that includes dietary changes and lifestyle changes. So, in herbal medicine, kind of herbal lingo, we talk about the alteratives. Alteratives are the is the name that we give for the group of herbs that all have some sort of impact on improving elimination in some way. It's a pretty general term, but they're going to be herbs for detoxification. Who here has seen some kind of image like this before, the analogy of body as bucket or the rain barrel theory? I haven't seen this before. This is just kind of, I didn't create this, but it is, um, I think it's a, it's a nice image to help with patients and their understanding of uh, when we talk about detoxification, just you know what we're talking about. If we view the body as a bucket and it's being filled with water or rain, or uh, and these are being imagined as different toxins or stressors that we're putting into our body, and we only have some you know limited capacity. These our elimination organs are what's able to rid our body and metabolize those toxins. If 
things build up too fast or if any of those elimination routes become plugged, then we see that manifestation kind of spill out. Things start to spill and some of the first places that we'll recognize that will be on the skin, which is common. We see cases of eczema and psoriasis and acne and the first thing we want to do is look at the liver and the bowels, for example. Um, mucous membranes become irritated, inflamed. You know, it's just essentially chronic inflammation is what's going on. And if I can stress sort of three of the main areas today, it's that I think that herbs can help with the most, it's supporting uh, efficient bile flow, efficient bowel function, and, and bladder function, kidney bladder function. So the removal of both fat soluble and water soluble metabolites through the bowels, primarily through the bile and the bladder and lymph which doesn't fit in my nice alliteration there, the BBBs. But lymph, I think, gets really overlooked. I think it's really important. And uh, we have herbs, all of our alternatives, in some way will support lymphatic stimulation, lymphatic drainage too. So, um, and of course, there's other methods to support lymph drainage, but that's a really important part of detoxification. So alternatives, what are they? We define them as any herb that will alter the body's processes of metabolism so that the tissues can best deal with a range of functions from nutrition to the elimination of metabolic waste. So it's pretty broad, it's pretty general, it's a very large grouping, and there's gonna be individual subgroupings within this that we'll look at. They are often tonics, meaning, and we'll talk about this as well, that they are very, um, they're quite gentle usually, or at least the way we want to use them is kind of as we use foods, and they're best kind of given in a long term, as a long term approach. Uh, these are a couple of my favorite alternatives. Uh, does anyone know the herb on the left? It's kind of like cannabis, but it's not. Stinging nettle, yeah, stinging nettle, or a nettle, or urtica, diosia, which is you know, a fabulous mineral rich a uh, very nutritional and uh, detoxifying green that comes up in the spring and I love putting into infusions and uh, various protocols and I'll run actually, I love running workshops as well. I do a lot of, again, trying to get people hands on with herbs as much as we can and I do a workshop in the spring where we, we build uh, a kind of a spring cleansing tea together and that's what you see on the right there and that's got some red clover and some calendula and lots of nettle and lots of lymphatics and um, just really nutritious herbs. So. Yeah, a lot, a lot of these herbs are, are pretty gentle in their approach and really nourishing and nutritive. Some of the ones we're going to talk about with more direct effects that I think probably this group is more interested in, okay, how do I actually apply detoxification in my practice with herbs? We're obviously going to be looking at hepatics and understanding the difference between hepatic stimulants and then hepatic tonics or restoratives. So actually, how do we help regenerate liver cells, which is pretty incredible that our liver can do that and that herbs can help uh, enhance that, that process. The laxatives, of course, and these can be, again, stimulant or bulking or osmotic in their effects. Diuretics, which can also be stimulant or osmotic, or osmotic. and then the lymphatics, which can be stimulant and osmotic. So all just different types of alternatives. And all of the herbs that we're going to talk about are alternatives and will affect multiple organ systems, but there's going to be tissue specificity as well. So there's going to be big key herbs to the jump to our mind when we think about each of these systems. So what does everyone think of when we think of liver support? Milk thistle, silly marin. Yeah, of course, for sure. Uh, and what about a stimulant laxative? Anyone think of one that jumps to mind? You can get it at the drugstore, cascara, yeah, or senna. Um, Senecot, it's a very popular natural laxative that you can get at the drugstore. So yeah, there's kind of key herbs that act on these organ systems that we're going to talk about. They have specificity, but herbs never do one thing. They always are working on multiple levels, which is another reason why I love to use them so much. So yeah, this issue of tonics versus effectors I just want to come back to whenever we are thinking about herbs. Um, uh, and uh, the same herb could be used as a tonic or effector depending on the dose, but it's in your treatment strat strategy, the way that you're going to approach a patient, usually we want to use herbs as tonics, as kind of long-term normalizers, like foods. They're not meant to be taken for a couple weeks and then forgotten about. They're meant to be used on an ongoing basis to support our health. I'll often compare it to like eating well or having a you know, big delicious kale salad one day for lunch. It, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get all the benefits from that salad. You need to eat that salad a lot in order to get the, the, the long-term benefits. So it's the same with herbs. It's an important conversation, I think, to have with patients. Uh, 
starting out that you know they might they need to be engaged in this process that it's this isn't a quick fix herbs are not a quick fix unfortunately or fortunately uh, they become a lifestyle so this I've tried to put together a lot of the things that I've already just talked about uh, looking at alternatives the major groupings of alternatives the organ systems that they act on and then understanding that different types of that they will have, different herbs will have either more of that tonifying, nourishing effect, or more of that stimulant, um, more directly physiological action on the body. And depending on your patient, depending on how they present and their history, you're going to be choosing different actions, uh, primarily. You're gonna be prioritizing different actions for your patient. And we're gonna go through a case together to sort of demonstrate this. So this is a case very common, I see a lot of um, women kind of in this age group, in, young, young professionals in my practice. Uh, she, was, uh, she was a lawyer, so very like high stress, uh, intense person, but she didn't have time to exercise. She was always complaining of feeling like foggy, sluggish, reaching for sugar all of the time. Uh, her primary concern was really bad PMS, like really bad irritability, um, acne breakouts before her cycle, and some pelvic discomfort. And she was also experiencing some IBS symptoms and particularly constipation, so sluggish digestion as well. She had a past medical history of hemorrhoids, um, internal, and she had spent 20 years on an oral contraceptive. So, and this, that's crazy, but also not that uncommon. She just stopped it and was looking to kind of support her body. And she's also done two rounds of Accutane in the past five years, which is pretty rough on the liver too, right? So, for yourselves, like you might already be, so there's lots going on here, obviously, but what do we want to approach first with this patient in, from a detoxification standpoint? What would you guys be thinking? Dandelion. Dandelion, okay, great. So I love it. You're already thinking about herbs. And why dandelion root? Because what is it doing in the body? Liver lymphatic, bitter stimulation, great. Gentle laxative from its, its liver stimulant effects. So yeah, you're already thinking about, okay, what organ systems are needing the most support here and what are some herbs we could use? That's, that's great. So, and, you know, we each are different in our clinical approaches. We might approach this case differently, but for me, definitely I felt like liver uh, was, was going to be key for her and bowels, needing to get her bowels moving. But given her history on those medications and her symptom picture, uh, and if you, any, yeah, any of you are also, like, yeah, those of you who are TCM practitioners, uh, what, um, what emotion is associated with liver? Anger, Anger irritability, frustration, congestion in that organ system. So that, that also was kind of sticking out to me. So, uh, to address this case, obviously we need to address diet, we need to address lifestyle, we need to remove her exposure to you know, estrogens, refined sugars, all of that. Herbs aren't going to mask over the, these types of foundational um, things that we need to work on. But definitely improving liver function, hopefully helping with the sugar cravings and improving her estrogen metabolism. We need to encourage peristalsis um, as well to encourage the metabolism of those endogenous estrogens and exogenous estrogens she's been dealing with. We're going to do that through stimulating bile flow, promoting both phase one and phase two detox, and increasing soluble fiber, and maybe using some short-term uh, stimulant laxatives, and then of course, so we're kind of working on all levels of those detox organs, but focusing on the, the liver and the, and the bowels. And so this I tried to kind of pit Put, put together because you know we're dealing with a case this is like a, her primary concern is P PMS and she was like oh should I just take Vitex or like let's work on my hormones and it's like well we need to step back and recognize that actually what we need to do here is focus on the enterohepatic circulation of those uh, estrogens in your body that aren't being properly removed from your system and so um, you know uh, explaining that bowel health is really important to whether or to how much of those um, um, the estrogens that are being metabolized are then being unconjugated and brought back into the circulation are, are just sitting in her bowels because her bowels aren't moving properly. So, and then I start brainstorming herbs. So I'm going to be thinking about milk thistle and, la and flaxseed and schizandra and, and again start um, moving forward here. So looking at the hepatics specifically, you guys are mostly, I hope most of you are aware of the really big difference or what a choleretic and a cholagog is versus a liver tonic. So this is a terminology uh, piece, but choleretics and cholagogs, these are liver stimulants. And some of those you know, hepatic tonics will have some effects on bile flow, but it's mostly about the regeneration of hepatocytes. So both are important, but some cases are going to require one over the other. 
Generally, when I'm dealing with really sluggish digestion, kind of, and the bowels aren't moving, and uh, and I, you know, people who have issues in, like dyspeptic sort of symptoms, where things just like feel kind of stuck after they eat, the stimulants definitely are going to be prioritized for me. But for her, given her history, how long she'd been on those medications, and her symptoms, the hepatoprotectives seemed really important too. And so. The protectives are protecting the liver from free radical damage. That's what they do. Every time that the body has to break down an estrogen, it creates free radicals, and so that is creating damage in that organ. So I want to help regenerate the liver, absolutely. And uh, we have you know, lots of different research coming out around how herbs are helping to do this, one being um, helping with the expression of specific microRNAs. The stimulants, we know bile flow, it's great. Why do we need bile? Bile does lots of wonderful things in our body. Yes, it will help as a natural laxative. Uh, it will also help with the excretion of bilirubin, cholesterol, uh, absorption of our fat and fat-soluble vitamins, and really important, regulating the intestinal pH and the microbial balance of the intestine. So when we look at conditions like SIBO, or bacterial overgrowth. Um, I'm really interested in, in moving bile, getting bile activity flowing to get the bowels moving as a root cause. So some examples, uh, both of these herbs. So what I've done here is just given you the different groupings and some herbs we're gonna talk about today. This is not a complete list by any means, but I think it's a good place to start. Some of my favorites. And, uh, and remembering that the cholagogs and the choleretics, anything bitter is gonna stimulate bile flow too. So just if you're thinking about your herbal bitters, your bitter herbs, they're gonna fall into this category as well. And it's not always de like sharply delineated. There's overlap here. Um, we'll see with cyanara or artichoke, for example. Artichoke was long known as primarily a bowel stimulant, I'm sorry, a bile stimulant, and now we have research that shows that it's actually a fantastic hepatoprotective. So uh, yeah, herbs can do both. You wanna be careful with the stimulants any stimulant, whether it's a laxative stimulant or a hepatic stimulant, if you're dealing with somebody who has a lot of irritation and inflammation within the, um, within the, within the gut. So I wouldn't, uh, yeah, avoid it entirely, but it, you, know, you could aggravate things sometimes, and, and especially weaker constitutions. It's just something to keep in mind. So let's talk about my herb with my favorite name. Let's all just say silly bum. Silly bum? <laughs> It's a great name, it's a fun name to say. Silibum marianum, it's also known as Cardus marianum, or St. Mary's thistle, or milk thistle. They're all the same herb, so many herbs being in Australia, they call it St. Mary's thistle there. Uh, milk thistle, if you just look at this plant, is again why I love seeing the plants that we're talking about. It's, uh, it's got these big milky veins, we say. So the, that's how you identify this plant, is based on those big white, um, latexy, milky, uh, veins, we call them. And the part used of this plant is the fruit and the seed, but primarily the seed. And that's something that I think also gets kind of forgotten about sometimes. When we think about a seed, it, this actually, this seed isn't that different from something like flax seed in terms of its chemical makeup constituent profile. It's got full of lignans, full of flavonoids, um, and we got to crush that seed open in order to get the medicine that's inside. So yeah, that's a picture. It's like part of the germination component of the plant. Uh, I'm going to have to move. I'm realizing I'm moving kind of slow. So I'm going to kind of try to speed up. But there's lots of information here. If, in, there's lots of information available on the Holistic Matters website as well about how, about specifically pharmacology mechanism of action. Uh, but with, when it comes to milk thistle, I think it's important to talk about silymarin. We talk about silymarin. Silymarin is actually a combination of uh, flavolignans. So when we talk about curcumin, Curcumin is, a, is one of a collection of curcuminoids. So silymarin, we, we usually will standard, products will be standardized to their silybin content, which is one of the flavolignans. And we sometimes will call this the silymarin complex. So this is the most well-researched herb for its hepatic effects by far. And it's been able, I would say, if you think about it primarily, what it does is it's a potent uh, free radical scavenger within the liver that has the ability to regenerate glutathione, which is incredible <laughs> within hepatocytes, and stabilize membranes, both of the hepatocyte itself and the mitochondrial membranes. So it's protecting the liver and, in that sense, allowing it to regenerate if given what it, if it has what it needs in order to do that. Um, also uh, increasing ribosomal RNA and protein synthesis and possibly control of DNA expression. So there's, um, there's really good research around this herb's ability to do this. 
we think about taking it to, uh, you know, oh, I know some people are like, oh, I, got, I had too much to drink last night, I'll take some milk thistle. That's not exactly how it works. The ideal way to use this plant is as prophylactic, really, as preventative, as protection um, from, from stressors. But of course, it can be taken after exposure to various xenobiotics. And uh, in this case, with this case with this woman, I saw this as a herb that would be a friend to her for a while. So looking at sort of minimum three to six months to help regenerate those, those liver cells. Good review, 2018 review on uh, the protective effects. So milk thistle also can inhibit, uh, can act to kind of block toxins from entering liver hepatocytes as well. And this sort of goes into that, but I won't. Uh, won't spend too much there. And then dosing, just looking for something that's standardized to its silymarin contents, important. This is a very safe herb. Um, no restrictions that we know, on, know of in terms of using it long term or um, the you know, toxicity symptoms, really rare, um, usually GI related or allergy related. Absorption of silymarin is quite poor. Most of you may have heard that before, but we do want to try to enhance its absorption when possible. It's, uh, I remember like a student once, seeing a student have these milk thistle seeds and they were making a tea with it and they just poured hot water over the seeds and we're like, hmm, I saw them drinking it in class, they were helping their livers. No, <laughs> not at all, that was a waste of their time and money. You need to crush those seeds, it needs alcohol as a solvent to extract the silymarin from it or some other salt, stronger solvent than water in order to get the silymarin out. And then once it is in the body, even then the bioavailability is quite poor and it seems to be enhanced with things like lecithin or other emulsifiers. There's some uh, interactions you need to be aware of, and the main one, I would say, it, it has uh, the potential to reduce iron absorption and storage. So often you'll see um, la warning labels saying to, to take away from iron supplementation or an iron-rich meal. Um, it's also been used to help pull iron out of the body in hemochromatosis, which is interesting too, so can, can work in that way. Okay, Shazandra. Another fun herb to say, actually. This is Shizandra berries, or Wu Wei Ji, if I say that right, and used in traditional Chinese medicine as a liver tonic. Oops, uh, we don't have as much evidence around it, its effects. However, it's really, really remarkable what's coming out around Shizandra and its ability to act as a hepatoprotective. I would say nearly on par to milk thistle. And it's the lignin, lignins, once again, the schizandrins, and there's a variety of different schizandrins in this plant. Uh, this is also known as the five flavored berry. If anyone's ever put it on their tongue before, has anyone tasted schizandra? Or even if you just have the tincture, it's kind of a similar effect. It's a real, whew, I've never tasted anything like it. It kind of goes through all the five flavors, uh, from sweet to salty to sour, to, it ends with kind of this spicy, peppery kind of kick. It's quite interesting. And a TCM, anyway, oh, oh I'm gonna get side railed. Um, beside, so the lignin's primary active components in these plants, they've actually been developed into uh, a couple of medications, specifically being um, used to treat liver disease. Hepatoprotective, also adaptogenic. That's probably how it's most well known, I would say, is as an adaptogen. People tell it to help, use it to help with stress, anxiety, uh, even insomnia, and that's a traditional use of schizandra for sure. It can help facilitate regeneration of glutathione within the liver and also inhibit the uh, activation of various hepatotoxins. And it has this anxiolytic effect. And this one study I thought was really interesting in, a, in mice, uh, these poor mice, they just stressed the heck out of them. So they put them in these restraint models. And so they restrained the mice for 18 hours and found what happened was, can anyone say, well, let's hear, severe liver damage <laughs> happened just from stress. So it really, I think, opened my eyes when I read this, my gosh, just the, the impact of acute stress on our livers and how our liver is such a hugely important sensory organ for inflammation. And any time we're supporting the body's ability to adapt to stress, such as the adaptogens do, we are also having this hepatoprotective effect, which is pretty, pretty cool to think about, I think. And then they, what they did is they gave the mice uh, for five days prior to the restraint model testing a uh, schizandra liquid extract and found that the liver damage was, was significantly decreased. And they measured that with um, liver enzymes, ALT specifically, I believe. 
So lots of, again, good evidence, kind of current evidence on the hepatoprotective effects of schizandra. You can read through at your leisure. Rosemary is another herb I want to talk about. Maybe not one you would think of right off the bat as a, as a hepatic, but also some pretty cool information coming out around it. It's primarily known as a hepat as a um, aromatic, volatile oil-rich plant, carminative, antimicrobial, circulatory stimulant, all of those types of things. Uh, very rich in volatile oils, specifically carnosol and carnosic acid, are the two terpenes uh, that seem to be the most pharmacologically relevant. Some studies, though, have shown, again, hepatoprotective properties, uh, the ability to induce both phase one, phase two enzymes in some in vivo studies. But the really cool part is this enhanced metabolism of endogenous estrogens. And what they found is when they fed mice a whole lot of rosemary, they began to, um, to with both estradiol and estrone, increase the oxidation and glucuronidation of these. So basically inactivate and help with the removal of excess amounts of, of these estrogens and also inhibit uterotropic effects. So the downstream kind of anabolic effects of these hormones on the uterus lining was also decreased in these little female mice. And there's some, some interesting information coming out around its role in breast cancer now, actually due to its ability to have anti-estrogenic effects and, uh, and support phase one, phase two liver detox. So cool things about rosemary. Globe artichoke or cynara, one of my favorite vegetables, dipped in butter, uh, but this is not how we're using it here, but it is the whole plant that's used. It's very nutritious, very nutrient dense, full of vitamins and minerals, full of inulin, so that prebiotic that feeds, um, uh, helps build short chain fatty acids, feeds healthy bacteria within the microbiome. And its primary use is research is around dysglycemia, dyslipidemia, and in general, kind of poor, again, indigestion or dyspepsia. Hepatoprotective effects have been noted, again, in terms of upregulating various antioxidant enzymes. And some good research specifically around non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in this plant. So again, liquid extract being given, I believe this was over 12 weeks in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, showing um, significant improvements. So 600 milligrams was given uh, daily over placebo for, sorry, for two months and showing reductions in cholesterol, uh, all cholesterol markers basically, all elevated liver parameters and also, also did ultrasound found improvement on ultrasound liver parameters as well. So two months on artichoke. Yeah, <laughs> really cool. And the pharmacology, not super well researched at this point. We do know that the bitter components, those sesquiterpene lactones are playing a role. Inulin may be having a beneficial effect on the gut microbiota and that some of the components may have effects on enzymes in, in uh, cholesterol and carbohydrate metabolism. I'm running through herbs pretty quick here. <laughs> Good. Uh, Taraxacum, so dandelion root. So this is also a question that comes up. Dandelion root and leaf, pretty different plants and different approaches. So the root of dandelion, specific for the liver. The leaf of dandelion, specific, can anyone, can anyone tell me? Anyone know? Kidney, bladder, yeah, is specific for improving diuresis. Both are bitter. Both will somewhat stimulate... Um, you know, it will have that kind of liver stimulant activity, but uh, the, the root is really what you want to use if you're trying to, to treat any sort of liver disorder of any kind. Um, very mild laxative, so the root is often roasted. It's used as like a coffee substitute quite a lot because it has that kind of bitter, um, earthy taste. I don't, I don't find it actually that bitter. It's nothing like gentian or <laughs> cynara, that's for sure. Uh, and it also contains quite a lot of inulin, so like cynara, a high source of pro uh, prebiotic, and nut very nutrient dense. This is a food, and you can, you can go and harvest, and I like this picture too, because this is, dandelion's a city weed, right? It grows, or people plant, it grows, this is like a, right next to a dumpster in an alley by my house. I would never harvest from here, but it's medicine, it's growing everywhere, and it's, its primary role is detoxification of our livers. It's pretty crazy. Um, Anyhow, you could harvest dandelion and chop it up and mix it into a stir fry for dinner if you have dandelion on your property and, uh, and you feel good about no pesticides and things like that. That's, it's a food. And again, 
some good in, uh, some good research around hepatoprotective effects in, in animals mostly. Burdock, another food similar to dandelion. It's a root. It's called gobo in Japanese culture. You also you can dig this up, eat it. It's much like a parsnip. Very high in inulin. Very high in vitamins and minerals. And it's been researched for some of its insulinotropic effects. So it, it's actually been shown in animal models, at least, to be quite successful in treating diabetes, um, increasing insulin, decreasing blood glucose. And again, constituents we see, there's a lot of the same constituents come up, lignans, inulin, bitter compounds. Those are kind of the main things we're looking for when we're trying to support hepatic function. And I'm going to skip through that so we can get to the laxatives. So looking at the laxatives now, so we've talked about the liver. Bile's gonna flow, what's gonna happen now? We need to move things out. And we can do that in a couple of ways, through bulking osmotic laxatives. And these are things like chia and psyllium and you know, a lot of things that people are already commonly using, or those stimulant laxatives that are going to actually irritate the lining of the gut wall to cause a bowel movement. And bitters and hepatics will have a bit of a laxative effect as well. Stimulant laxatives are not always a good idea, but I do like to say, if anyone thinks that herbs don't do anything, just take a stimulant laxative and prove them wrong because they do something. Um, they are, yeah, we, ha we in naturopathic school actually have to do, uh, all of the students have to do a personal assignment with Senna. <laughs> they all have to take it over the course of a few days and then document their effects. If you've never taken Senna, you, I don't know, maybe don't. <laughs> it's probably not. But it's a, it's a kind of a rite of passage, I think, if you're going to be using these herbs and understanding what they do. Uh, other stimulant laxatives, the latex of aloe, uh, cascara, tricky rhubarb. We're going to talk about yellow dock just really briefly. And so these are all anthroquinone containing herbs versus the bulking laxatives, which mostly contain mucilage or kind of soluble forms of, forms of fiber, would be things like psyllium husk, flax, chia, slippery elm, marshmallow, things like that. And uh, yeah, so these are the, the bulking laxatives, stool softeners, full of mucilage. They absorb water into the intestine, and they cause kind of this uh, the, a reflex peristalsis-like effect. Um, they're very safe. They need to be taken with lots of water, no risk of dependency. They can cause gas and bloating in some people, or they can worsen SIBO overgrowth in some people. And they might interfere with any drug or medication that's taken alongside it. Anything that affects bowel transit time has the ability to do that. So just keeping that in mind, but very useful. And flax is by far my number one recommendation. Two tablespoons of flaxseed a day if people can do it, or one if two's too much. And this is, again, due to the lignans, which is a tough word to say, but the psychoisola ricinoresinol <laughs> diglycoside converts into uh, and Pterodiol and another compound called enterolactone within, by gut bacteria within the intestine. And both of these compounds have been pretty well researched for their ability, for the anti-estrogenic effects. So, and potential breast cancer uh, use in reduction of breast cancer, we're starting to see. Um, they can compete with estradiol uh, quite well. They can inhibit aromatase enzymes and they can increase the production of sex hormone binding globulin by the liver. So a lot of good stuff if we're trying to do hormone balancing in, a, in women. Also, they improve the, um, the ratio of 2-hydroxyestrone to 16-hydroxyestrone, so the kind of protective, the more protective estrogens are uh, more, more available to the body. And that, so these stimulant laxatives, so now switching gears, uh, I do use them sometimes in my practice, but not, as, not that often. I, I think that they're good short term for cases of um, traveler's constipation or a short term detox program. So if somebody just wants to do a week or two, I'm fine giving them a stimulant laxative. But past that, they have the ability to cause addiction and dependence, which isn't that common with most of our herbs. Most herbs don't have any qualities like this, but, but these do. And most of you have probably seen it in the, your practice, I would imagine, people being very dependent on laxatives. They work. It's great to have something that works if you're constipated, and so you just keep using it. And over time, your bowels become lazy, and they require this, laxative, uh, this stimulant effect in order to have a bowel movement. It's also the potential for abuse, for electrolyte imbalances. And they have been risk long-term. Um, use might be a risk for bowel cancer due to pigmentary changes that happen within the colon as well. So not a long-term solution, 
but good to know that they can be used short term and um, and they, they do have, you know, the, the very often they'll cause acute intestinal pain and cramping. So I'll often pair them with carminatives and usually they are paired with like fennel or peppermint or something to ease the cramping because it can be so uncomfortable for some people. And the, how they work, the anthraquinone glycosides are primarily responsible for those effects. Um, they need to be activated by the gut bacteria, so having good uh, a good microbial balance is important. It's a local effect. There's almost no systemic absorption of these anthraquinones, but they, they do have really targeted effects on both causing uh, a local stimulation of prostaglandins, kind of an irritant-like action that will cause peristalsis to occur, and also acting on um, electrolytes like uh, sodium chloride and potassium and, and affecting those balances and, and pulling more water, having an osmotic effect in the gut. So things like Emodin, which again, a uh, type of over-the-counter laxative you can get. Rumix crispus, I do want to mention yellow dock. I think it's a lesser known herb. I don't know if anyone's using yellow dock in, in their practices, but yellow dock contains anthraquinones. It does. So all of those sort of safety things apply, but far less in quantity than, say, Senna does. So there's a much milder laxative effect, effect when you use yellow dock. Yellow dock's also quite high in tannins, which can offset the anthraquinone activity. So if you're looking for something that is gentler, we'll still kind of have a stimulant laxative effect, but we don't have to be as concerned for its long-term use. I would still not use it without taking breaks over time, but it's, it's a good option, I think. And it's traditionally used, it's traditional uses in skin disorders, which is interesting, primarily eczema, psoriasis, acne disorders associated with constipation. So that's how traditional herbalists viewed how to use this plant, and now we kind of understand why and what it's doing. We definitely, I should have mentioned this on the last slide, never want to use stimulant laxatives in pregnancy or lactation. That's a full, absolute contraindication. And if you're using them, um, long-term pulse dose, I like to say, so take breaks and consider pairing with a carminative uh, as well. And so our last group of actions we're gonna look at are uh, the diuretics and the lymphatics. And I pair these two together because when we move lymph, lymph then flows out through the bladder. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, and many of the herbs that work in either of these ways overlap. So we want to increase, and diuresis can be, again, stimulant or osmotic. I think it's something like coffee. Coffee is a diuretic, right? And that's because of more of a stimulant effect. But uh, that's maybe not always the best thing for, uh, for us. We want to look at other diuretics that are really nutrient dense and um, will help replenish some of the electrolytes that get lost. And then the lymphatics can work on various levels. They can work at the level of the lymph nodes or with stimulating the whole of the lymphatic circulation. So starting with the diuretics, Eric Yarnell is a herbalist at Abastier University and naturopath. He's got a great paper. You can read about uh, the different actions of herbal diuretics and he kind of ranks his in terms of strength um, and secondary effects. So juniper, we'll just touch on quickly. Juniper is where we get gin. Uh, it's primarily known as a carminative and an antimicrobial and a diuretic. It's volatile oils, uh, specifically one terpene, it seems to be especially high in, is the terpenine forol, um, is a little bit of an irritant at the level of the glomerulus. And, and so it can increase filtration rate of the kidneys. But interestingly, hot water extracts uh, will also have this diuretic effect and you won't get the terpenes in hot water. So we're not exactly sure how, how juniper is working just yet, but animal studies definitely point to an increase in uh, volume of urine that's being expelled, even though we don't know exactly how it's doing it yet. Uh, you do want to avoid it in acute kidney inflammation and potentially in pregnancy. Juniper has got kind of a bad rap as being a, a nephrotoxin. I don't believe that it is. We don't have any evidence to say it is, but it, whenever you're using really strongly vo volatile oil-rich herbs like this internally, long-term, you just want to be careful. Okay. Tastes great, too, by the way. <laughs> and then uh, our dandelion leaf. So we talked about the root, now focusing on the leaf, recognizing that this part of the plant is more known for its diuretic effects. It's uh, all much more bitter than the root, in my opinion. If you chop up a couple dandelion leaves in your salad, you, you know, know kind of just how intense that can be, uh, and very highly nutritional. It's considered a potassium-sparing diuretic. It's so rich in potassium that even though you're getting diuresis, you're actually putting more potassium back into the body, which is pretty great. And uh, it will have that kind of bitter laxative component uh, as well as the diuretic effect. 
animal study in um, showing that pretty high amounts would have a diuretic effect comparable to that of furosemide. And this is another study that I get my students to do. They have to measure their urine output over the course of a week while taking dandelion leaf. It's really funny, you go into the bathroom at the school and you see all these little measuring cups with like plas in plastic bags all over the floor of the bathroom because all the students are measuring their urine output. Uh, and they're really interesting papers to read. And a one, but still kind of interesting. And then this is the last herb I'm going to talk about today, which is uh, cleavers. And cleavers is, if you see it growing in nature, it, it's kind of like natural Velcro, same way burdock is. It, like the burrs kind of stick to your dog or stick to your clothes, and that's where it gets its name from. This is gallium aparine, and gallium aparine is a, a diuretic, but I would say most well recognized traditionally as a lymphatic. This is one of my favorite lymphatic herbs, and it has tissue specificity to the pelvic region. And so whenever I feel there's congestion within the pelvic region, this is a herb that I reach for. We have very little information on it pharmacologically and no studies demonstrated in humans. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but the traditional use of this herb, the long-term use, the safety profile of it is, is so um, robust. And there is some research in mice around cellular immunity and potential anti-cancer effects in, in vitro. So uh, this is, and one thing I wanna say about diuretics too is whenever we give diuretics or lymphatics, make sure you're giving lots of water, lots and lots of water. We need to be, that's the whole intention, is, is flushing the system. So coming back to our case, just remembering what's going on here, and talked about all of these random herbs, and what our considerations would be for her. So who is she? What's she going to be willing to do I have lots of ideas, but practically, what is she going to be willing to do? And you also don't want to push detoxification pathways too quickly. Um, you know, many of you may experience this before. I have. I went too fast and didn't feel good. So you have to kind of, you know, know your patient, know their health status, establish what your goals are, and then and then put a plan together that way. You want to take this systems-based approach. So look back, look at her whole picture. What systems? What organ systems are most in need of support? then choose what actions meet those symptoms. And then decide if it needs to be a more tonifying effect or more of a strong stimulant effect. And then we choose our herbs. So I just want to come back to that. Clinically, we often just want to jump to herbs, like pick a herb out of a hat. But coming back to these steps, systems, actions, and then herbs, and, and tonics and effectors, will help you make better clinical choices. And once you've chosen your herbs, you start brainstorming your herbs, then you, you know, feel like you have strong rationale behind either constituents pharmacology or the traditional uses and safety profile. And be very aware of safety. I know I'm talking about herbs very kind of like blasé today, but we ha you know, they, are, they are potent medicines, and so they're not going to fit for every, every person. So coming back, our big picture, showing kind of a systems-based approach here. I, I prioritized what systems for this case need the most support. I've picked the actions that need the most support. Remember, these are all alternatives. And then I start brainstorming actions that work, the, sorry, herbs that have those actions. So what I, that's basically what I've done here, and this is, again, not complete, but it's a, a place to start um, for when I put together my protocol. And so my final protocol for her, she was really willing and ready. So we, and I usually will start people at like, I'll say, let's do, let's do two weeks. And then we check in at two weeks. And I'm like, oh, let's do another month. And people are, if they're feeling good, they're on board. Uh, I'm, my goal is three months, minimum one, um, but three is ideal. On top of that, we of course did dietary adjustments. Uh, digital detox is something I'm a big fan of for mental health, nature time, 30 minutes a day. Uh, way, other ways to move lymph through infrared sauna, contrast hydrotherapy in the shower is something I recommend a lot, and sometimes skin brushing. Castor oil packs are a tough sell for people, but I like to always try. And then a hypoallergenic diet, where we really emphasize nutrient, phytonutrient-dense foods and high-quality fat protein. And yeah, this was a success over the course of three months. Um, I don't have a, a summary slide here, but over the course of three months, and she kind of, she fell off the wagon with some things, and you know, she wasn't cons as consistent as I necessarily hoped she would be, but overall, bowel function was greatly restored, and her PMS symptoms really improved as well, which was the two main reasons she was coming. Um, and she continues to this day to do the flax. She loves her tablespoon of flax every single day, which I feel really good about. So thank you all very much for your attention. I appreciate your time.